Good morning, everyone. Great to see you today. I hope you've had a great day in the Lord already. Thank you for worship. Thank you for those kind words, Dr. Greenway, and what a privilege it is to be here in this chapel service today. I want to take an opportunity to welcome anyone who is joining us as well uh, on the web and streaming this live or even later on watching it. We're thankful for you. Thank you that you have joined in into a very special place, the place where I graduated twice, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. You know, last night I had the privilege of having dinner with your new president. Man, what a great time. I mean, I recommitted my life to Southwestern. Uh, <laughs> it was powerful, and uh, I'm so grateful to the Lord for his leadership and the energy and the vision and the passion, uh, the clear, compelling leadership that he brings. I'm so very, 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 very grateful. So thank you, Dr. Greenway. And I will tell you, I believe in his leadership, and I believe in the future of Southwestern Seminary. And I want to thank all of you for being a part of this great school. And I hope that you will do your very best to recruit others to come to this great place. There's no place like it. And even this morning, early out, running, while it was dark, I think the police thought I was going to hold somebody up or something. They started following me as I was going around the dome. But uh, I was at home at the dome and almost got uh, arrested. But it was great. And I'm really thankful for the privilege of being able to be here today and praise the Lord for it. You know, one of the great management gurus in the past was a man named Peter Drucker. Drucker was known as the father of modern management theory. It was Drucker who called for a more collaborative workplace in the business, and he advocated strongly for developing something in a business called culture. You see, to Drucker, relationships mattered because ideas flourish when relationships are good. He believed that management is the art of getting things done through people. Now, one day, if you become famous like Peter Drucker or somebody else, you will make statements that are powerful and they will stand the test of time. For example, one of Drucker's statements is this statement, management is doing things right, leadership is doing the right things. Pretty good statement, right? And Drucker was also credited with the following statement, not attributed really to him until after his death. So there's a debate whether or not he really said it, but it's a powerful statement. And the statement is, culture eats strategy for breakfast. You said, oh, wait a minute. What does that mean? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. You see, if the culture Drucker believed in a business is not compatible with the strategy, it doesn't matter what your strategy is because it would never last. And that is so true for what's happening so much in Christianity today. We have a culture in many of our churches that is not compatible with the strategy that we have. And the strategy to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to every person in the world deserves a culture in the church that is full of life and vitality and love. Is that existent in your church? You see, it's important that we understand that the way we treat people, it matters. And the way we treat people, it even matters to God. Until this last May, on the 19th day, I was the senior pastor of a church for over 32 years and seven months, the same church. In that large, multi-campus, growing church that now is over 149 years old, we saw the Lord do some amazing things all because of a culture of trust a culture of unity, and a culture of love. 
You know, when I was a student at Southwestern Seminary in my first year, the Southern Baptist Convention meeting was in Houston, Texas that year. It was 1979. And Gina and myself, we went. I didn't go for a purpose. I knew it was close, and I wanted to go. So I went. I had no reason to go except I wanted to be a part because I didn't know anything. I was just a seminary student. And I had come from a church with about 30 to 40 people on a Sunday morning. So I wasn't extremely educated about the things of Southern Baptist life. But you know, all these years now that I've watched us, I've watched us again and again begin to have an unhealthy culture. An unhealthy culture in our Southern Baptist family that is not compatible with a strategy to reach every person in every town, every city, every state, and every nation. And how in the world are we going to do that if we do not understand the value of the way we treat one another and the way we operate within the local churches of which comprise the Southern Baptist Convention? You see, the way we are and the way we treat people, it matters to God. Therefore, it should matter to us. Let me give you an additional insight. The Southern Baptist Convention is a convention of churches. And the Southern Baptist Convention, when Dr. Greenway speaks to it or someone else or myself, when we speak to it of a matter of a concern, in reality, the Southern Baptist Convention only reflects a lot of what's going on in the churches. But here's what I know. Unhealthy churches make up a convention that at times can be unhealthy. But I want to say it again today because I want it really to go deep in your heart because many days in the future from now, some days in the future from now, you will enter into local church ministry with your whole life or do something for the Lord around the world. The way we are and the way we treat ma people matters and it should matter to not only God, but to us. Today, I'm going to talk to you about something that a lot of people won't talk to you about because they assume you know and you live. But it's something that God has put on my heart in the last few months that quite honestly is one of our greatest needs in Southern Baptist life and one of the greatest needs in evangelical Christianity. Loving others like Jesus loves. Loving others like Jesus loves. Now, if you have a copy of God's Word, I want you to look with me to John chapter 13. And I want to read for you verse 34 and verse 35 in John 13. I'm going to read this morning from the Christian Standard Bible. Listen carefully to the Word of God. I give you a new command. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now in John 13, Jesus introduces various themes of his farewell to his disciples. His farewell begins to be recorded in John chapter 14 and the successive chapters. But the heart of John 13 is also the heart of the rest of John's gospel. In fact, in all reality, the heart of John 13 is really the heart of the New Testament church and should be the heart of the church in today's world. Listen again to what Jesus said. I give you a new command. Love one another. And just as I have loved you, what does he say? You are also to love one another. And by this, this meaning what? Love. By this, everyone will know 
You are my disciples if you love one another. Now I want you to imagine with me the context of John 13. Jesus had just washed the feet of the disciples, modeling to them servant leadership. He forecasted in that setting that one of them would betray him and then he released him to go and do it, demonstrating his sovereignty over all things. And then Jesus predicted that there was one among them who would deny him three times. And yet that same one said, I'm willing to lay down my life and die for you, Jesus. And yet, Jesus' actions, even in that setting and beyond, show the unconditional love of God for people. So imagine with me for a moment. Between forecasting the betrayal of Judas and the coming denials of Peter, the heartbeat of the message was love one another. One day when you enter into church life and you enter into ministry with all of your heart and your life, there will be people who will betray you and there will be people who will deny that they know you every now and then. But at the heart of that, how will you respond? Jesus said, love one another. You see, Jesus calls us to a higher life. Amen? He calls us to a better way to relate to one another. And you know what way that is? This is the way of love. By loving one another, everyone will know, Jesus said, you are my disciples. And the culture of love needs to permeate the culture of your marriage. Are you hearing me? The culture of your marriage. The culture of love needs to permeate the culture of your family. The culture of love needs to permeate the culture of your church, pastor and future pastor. And the culture of love needs to permeate the culture of the Southern Baptist Convention. Did you know in John 13, 34, Jesus mentions the word love three times in one verse. John 13, 35, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Did you hear what Jesus said? One action alone lets everyone know that we're Christ's followers. One, one, just one. Love one another. One action Love one another. While love is used 12 times from John chapter 1 to John chapter 12, love is used 44 times from John chapter 13 to John chapter 21. You see, love is the key theme in Jesus' farewell. You remember the prayer of Jesus for unity of his people over in John 17? You know what the burden was that Jesus had on his heart at that moment? It was the burden of love. What did Jesus pray? Listen to it in John 17, verse 26. I made your name known to them, and you will continue to make it known so that the love you have loved me with may be in them, and I may be in them. The early Christian apologist Tertullian quoted the pagans and their words about those early Christians. You know what the pagans would say about those early Christians? See how they love one another. They wash one another's feet and even lay down their lives for their friends. I wonder what pagan America says about the church today. I wonder what the world says about the church today. I wonder what your community would say about your church today. 
I wonder if they would say, see how they love one another? They wash one another's feet. They lay down their lives for each other. Listen carefully. We need to cease letting the toxic culture of America infiltrate the culture within our families, within our churches, within our convention of churches. As followers of Jesus Christ, our own culture for one another needs to rise up and capture the attention and the heart of this world. Hey, friend, do you want to change the world? And you want to change everything about the world? Love one another. It is love that distinguishes us, Jesus said. And it's love that sets us apart. It is love that is the transforming power in all relationships. It is love that transforms attitudes and behaviors. It transforms the culture around us. And think about what Jesus said when he said, I give you a new command in John 13, 34. I wonder what that word new means. It meant new in kind, new in experience, and new meaning, meaning fresh. Now, why was this possible? How was this possible? The death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the coming breath, the wind of the Holy Spirit being given to his disciples. When you hear those words, love one another, it expresses purpose. It is love that gives itself completely away. That's what love is. It is love that lays down one's life for someone else. It is love that seeks your welfare and the welfare of others. It is love, the kind of love that the Father loved Jesus with and the kind of love Jesus loved us with. Jesus said, that's the way I want you to love other people. It is love that transforms people. There's power in loving other people, loving those that are lovable and loving those who are not as easy to love. It is love that transcends problems in the relationship. You're newly married, got a little problem going on, it's love that will transform that marriage. Nothing else, nothing more, and nothing less. It is love that empowers you to love others, as Jesus said. Even when they come after you, Matthew 5, 44, what did Jesus say? But I tell you, love your enemies. And you love those and pray for those who persecute you. And one day when you're out here in the local churches of America and across the world, you might have an enemy or two. And when you preach God's truth, you may not even know them, but they may not like you. And you may know them, and they may not like you. But you've got to learn to love. You love them through it, and you love them in spite of it. You see, here it is, men and women, it's time for us to rise up and learn the power of what it means to forgive. We must learn what it means to release, to forget, to seek after the one who offends us and love him or her in a better way. I learned this through the years. When you belong to Jesus, you belong to love. It was in this school that a professor dying with cancer stood in one of these classrooms over here and he said, you students, you never forget it and I've never forgotten it. When you gave your life to Jesus, you forfeited the right to choose whom you would love. It was that same man who said, it's love. That's how the gospel, it travels on the tracks of a relationship. Never, never 
never let anyone outside of your circle of love. You see, when you seek after Jesus, you're going to learn to give love because you want to. You're going to be able to understand that love is many times sacrificial and love is even unconditional. And don't forget this. We can differ with other people, but yet we can still love one another. There's a way to be in a conversation and maybe not act like a jerk and maybe not leave there and act like a jerk. There's not one Baptist and certainly not one Christ follower who is given the exemption of the words of Jesus. You don't have an exemption. Love one another. By this loving one another, everyone will know that you are my disciples. Hear me now. Jesus did not say our scholarship, our degrees, our theology, our dress, or our music would set us apart and let people know we're his. Jesus said, no, by your love. By your love. They will know that you belong to me. We need right here at Southwestern Seminary to buy in all the way to the culture that Dr. Greenway's trying to lead us. Love one another. This crazy world where division is much more important to the American people than unity, it is us that needs to trust one another and love one another and honor one another. I'm deeply convicted that we need a new generation of Baptists that understand the power of respecting each other, believing the best about one another rather than the worst. And I ask you today, let's stop targeting one another in drive-by accusations via social media. It does not honor God. It certainly does not honor the word of God and why in the world are people so mad? Why are they so angry? I'll tell you one reason, because they don't feel loved. Listen carefully, and I want to be more than clear. For the past 30 to 40 years, we have stood strongly for and championed the sanctity of human life. I want to challenge you today that for the next 30 to 40 years, let's keep on championing the sanctity of human life, but let's also champion the dignity of human life. Not only those outside of the Baptist world, but inside of the Baptist world. You say, what does it mean then? I'll tell you what it means. Glad you asked. It means to respect one another. It means to value one another. It means to honor one another. It means to love one another. It means to forward, promote, and believe in Christianity. And for whatever it's worth, I, I just really want to be clear today. Christian leadership is not creating suspicion about someone else. Christian leadership is not striving to put others down or some group down below yourself. Christian leadership is not throwing other people under the bus. And Christian leadership is not promoting division and strife among brothers and sisters of Christ. Christian leadership does not target drive-by accusations via social media. That's not what Christian leaders do. Christian leaders, they live for Jesus. Christian leaders love 
other people. And Christian leaders forward and promote Christian unity. So students, faculty, and guests today, let's build that kind of Southern Baptist Convention in the future. Let's build that kind of, that kind of culture that is compatible with the strategy in the heart of Jesus in Acts 1-8 and Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Let's stop walking on our own message and stamping out our own strategy. And let's love people and one another the way we need to love them. Let's do our best to be a part of a generation of Baptists that will recapture what it means to love and will recapture what it means to walk in unity together. I unashamedly today call you to unity. Unity, that's what Christianity is all about. Unity is not something that we do. Some want to play down unity. Some want to mock unity like it's, you know, soft and, and you know, cushy-wushy. No. Why don't you read the Bible? <laughs> Jesus came. Jesus prays for us to be one. It is suspicion and gossip and lies and division. That's what needs to be denounced, not Christian unity. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4, 3, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The one note of the true church is love. The badge of Christian discipleship is love. Our highest duty to God and our highest duty to one another should be to love one another. Some of you might remember this old hymn, Love is the Theme, Love is Supreme. Sweeter it grows, glory bestows, bright as the sun, ever it glows. Love is the theme, eternal theme. You see, what we need, this is the kind of love that will transform the life of your family. It's that kind of love that will transform your marriage. It's that kind of love that can change a dead church and move it to life. We need a baptism of love. A baptism of love. And let the Holy Spirit baptize us in that love today. I close with these words today. And I'm not undervaluing any one of these things but I'm only saying it again because of the setting that we're in today. Jesus did not say that you would be known by your scholarship. And he did not say that you will be set apart by your degrees. And he did not say you would be set apart by your theology or your intellect or your dress or your music. Jesus said, the world's going to know who you are by one thing alone. The world's going to know who you belong to by one thing alone. Love one another. Holy Spirit, bless the word of God. We pray this now in Jesus' name, amen.